And that's where people become angry and that's where domestic violence happens and that's where things escalate to the point where hard recovery from that. Absolutely. And that's where we do things that we regret later. That's where we say things we should have not said. And then you cannot take it back, right? And, you know, a lot of times I treat people who are you know, really great people who called the cops because it was the escalation of the conflict and um, usually a wife would initiate this. And then, you know, in my cases, people always regret doing it because the police shows up and they're not equipped really to help people downregulate, right? So a lot of times it is just when we get married, we don't really get training about how to negotiate agreements, but it would be a good thing, right? Right. To like help people. But when things escalate, you know, the best thing is to just learn how to recognize that I am in this, like who's right, who's wrong, it's escalation and just, you know, step down. Right? As you speak, I'm thinking, you know, we have these prenuptial agreements in family law, but I think now that we talk about it, it could be good to have an emotional agreement to say, well, if you have childhood traumas that are unresolved, you have to do at least X amount of sessions to work on specific traumas. And then if this <laughs> anger comes up, then you need to X, Y, Z to create a really roadmap for behavioral uh, health. So to create a self-care plan to support each other. Absolutely. It is like, it sounds wonderful, but, you know, is it realistic for us to expect that people will be investing time and energy into learning how to be good partners before they really hit the pain point? So one of the things I know as a therapist, like, no pain, no gain. So a lot of times our brain that has been, like, helping us to survive physically for you know, millions of years of evolution. But now our stresses are different, but our brain has not really rewired itself yet to help us live in the 21st century. So we have this uh, part of the brain that is called default mode network that um, makes us scan for danger. So I always say to my clients, your brain is the danger detecting machine. And if there's no danger, you make it up. So a lot of times our conflict is a result of this, like having the ancient brain. So, you know, whether you are married or not, it is a good idea to learn like self-care and how to regulate your feelings. But the truth is we don't know what we don't know. Speaking of prenuptial agreement, I had two patients um, who came to see me with depression and both of them were referred by their attorneys. One of them was a very successful man, um, and he had a lot of assets. And when he came, he felt very depressed. And now, of course, in the first session, you always ask, what brings you here? And he says to me, I married a gold digger. Mm. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, tell me more. And he said that we've only been married for two years, and she's suing me, and, you know, I have to now sell my big house in Hillsborough and give her half, and I am like, hmm, that makes sense. You know, you only were married for two years, so how is that? He's in his 50s. Uh, this is his second marriage. He's very successful professionally. And then I say to him, so let me ask you how it happened that you married a woman, and now you're discovering these things about this. And he says, you know what? It's a good question you asked. Actually, now I'm thinking about it. She divorced two of her previous husbands under the same like circumstances. And he said, I made a mistake. Okay, tell me what kind of mistake you made. And he said, when we were leaving on our honeymoon trip, she has three kids from the previous marriage. She asked me to sign the document saying, what if we get killed in the car crash or you know, plane crash? Can you please sign this document? turning assets to my children. And he said, I remember I didn't want to make a scene because, you know, it was after the wedding, we were on the way, so I signed this document and now it is used against me because otherwise I would have not, like, uh, lost so, so much money. So that was an interesting... Oh, I have my brain is firing about... Yes. <laughs> ...because he didn't have representation, because he signed a document that sounds like a, a testament, a state planning document, not the prenuptial agreement. Seems like a but it was probably a mistake yeah. to not have a prenuptial agreement in this case. Right. And he is a very agreeable, sweet man. 
who made a lot of money, you know, because he is very good with people. So we project onto other people what we have inside. He is generous and kind to people. So he projected on his, like, now ex-wife that she is the same way, which wasn't the case. So I think prenuptial agreement is really important. And then the following week, I had another patient, and she is a wonderful, very educated woman, but she comes from a different country. And she was married, uh, marrying a guy who had a lot of assets, and his family insisted on um, the prenuptial agreement. And she felt very, very offended. She didn't want to sign it. So they started, like, negotiating, you know, whether she should or should not sign it. And she was so upset, she completely flipped her lid, and she attacked him physically. She felt that he should have trusted her. So in different cultures, you know, this is different, right? It's yes. handled differently. So I know in Russia that both of us lived the first, you know, in the former Soviet Union for me, yes, yes. Uh, where we lived. Um, there was no such thing, right? But people didn't also have, like, tremendous assets like we have here. So I understand why a woman would be upset, right? Of course. It's, it's, a, it's, it's about trust. It's about uh, man providing. That's, that's the, as far as I remember, that was my brainwashed material man is there to provide that there was no equal men and women and so I, I can only imagine no feminism no <laughs> <laughs> so glad it exists in some shape or form but uh, I have a lot of clients who got married to a newly from other country wife and they become violent against men that's a new trend yeah yeah, yeah. I, I know. I'm treating these clients as well. And a lot of times it is court-ordered anger management treatment. Yep. How do you find this, if you know, anger management classes? Are they really helpful? Because I have court-ordered 52 weeks anger management programs, and they're just some one hour, 52 yeah. hours total. I, I personally don't know if they're helpful. I would say... Staying therapy would be much more helpful than that. I have a joke about it. <laughs> anger management classes work. Until you are angry. <laughs> when people are angry, so what they learn a lot of times, people come to see me after they had taken classes. And sometimes I'm wondering, like, what have they learned? It's usually in the group setting. And maybe for some people it is helpful. I don't know about those people. But the ones who end up in my office, um, a lot of times when I ask it, it wasn't helpful. Because it's not an easy thing. So that's where childhood trauma a lot of times shows up. That's where our early wiring shows up for us. So a lot of times we just cannot control ourselves. So it's not easy to help people self-regulate. So our nervous system is like very dysregulated when you know, we take things personally when things escalate. If I could change one thing in our legal system is for people who are domestic violence abuser to not give them 52 weeks of anger management, but to order them for six months weekly uh, classified therapist therapy sessions. I'd vote for that. <laughs> <laughs>